Welcome back. And the topic this week is partly a discussion of project one, which we will do towards the end of the next lecture. But then uh, we are going to uh, mention some possible paths for project number two. And uh, this depends very much on your interests. So give it a four. You can use a break to uh, think over what you would like to do. I mean, some people have already sent me a message of what they would like to do. So we want this to be a little bit open-ended so you can tailor it more to your own scientific interests. However, uh, there may be a common denominator which we will keep uh, through the lectures. And uh, uh, the topic which I wanted to discuss today is about Fourier transforms. And some of you may have heard about the fast Fourier transform as one of the most efficient algorithms for signaling. And a quantum Fourier transform beats that algorithm. And so that is a, uh, even if you don't end up using it, it's something which I would call a very useful background information, which uh, can come handy later. We will use that uh, in case after the break, if we end up with a, a path which the majority of you are more interested in, that means to study specific algorithms. So the quantum Fourier transform enters something which is called the phase estimation algorithm, which was the original algorithm proposed for finding eigenvalues of uh, specific problems. So if you wanted to find the eigenvalues of an eigenvalue problem, that was one of the methods which was used. It's uh, very important for Shor's algorithm in order to factorize integers efficiently. Uh, there are other algorithms where it enters. So there are many possibilities after the break. So this is ab absolutely one of the possibilities. I mean, this is the study of other algorithms. So what that could mean uh, as another option uh, is to implement uh, as a project number two, is to implement the QFT and then for instance, study uh, the phase estimation algorithm and eventually Shor's algorithm. That's one possible path. Alternatively, as you see here, this actually these bullet points came out wrongly because these should be sub points under study other algorithms, okay? So it, on the Jupyter notebook, it came out wrongly, but if you look at the PDF, it comes out correctly. So there's something with the Jupyter notebook here which didn't go well. So these are sub points under study of other algorithms. So th these are two possible paths for the material after the break. And I know that many of you are actually interested in these topics. So give it a thought during the break and just shoot me a message of what you would like to see when we meet again after Easter. But one thing which I, you will definitely encounter and which we will need the first lecture after the break is about quantum Fourier transforms. And then we have roughly uh, four to five lectures. Uh, we will have the last sessions around the 10th of May, but then we will have the remaining sessions as sessions for project work. So we won't have any new lectures. We will have 15 weeks of lectures, and then we will have the last uh, weeks till the end of the semester, roughly around 20th of May, just dedicated to project work. I mean, yes. just coming here, solving problems, et cetera, and getting help for that. Then uh, some of you have also expressed an interest in uh, studying the solution of quantum mechanical eigenvalue problems with specific systems from atomic and molecular physics. Uh, a typical problem which people have solved then is an extension of what you have done now, but it could be the hydrogen molecule and we then would use uh, realistic effective Hamiltonians and what we will recommend then is that you typically you end up using a library like Qiskit or Penny Lane or similar ones. So you don't need to write everything from scratch yourself because when you deal with a full Hamiltonian, then you have to use something which is called a jordan wigner transformation of the Manibody Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operators. And that can be a little bit time consuming for just the remaining two months which we have. So. Uh, this could be one path, but then I would typically recommend that you use Qiskit or any of these softwares, which are more tailored to actually translating a given Hamiltonian from, let's say, quantum chemistry into what you have been doing now using the VQE. So this is another path. Uh, we do have uh, 
a possibility to look at quantum machine learning projects, if somebody is interested in that. So just give it a thought. Yeah. Oh, so quantum machine learning, what that you can actually show if you take a, a method like a Boltzmann machine and you implement that on a quantum computer, that can be run much more efficiently. The difference, however, is that the classical optimization part, like you do with the VQE, has been done, has to be done with a classical computer. So you would take, you can do this in many different ways. You can have quantum mechanical data, or you can have classical input data. And people have been using it like this uh, uh, data set, which is called the MNIST, which is just a set of handwritten numbers from zero to nine, and to classify them properly. You can do that with a classical algorithm, or you can do that with a neural network, which is implemented on a uh, quantum computer. But the thing is that this would still be a kind of hybrid method where the classical optimization part is done in the same way as you do the VQE. So uh, that textbook, which we mentioned by Maria Schult, has a very nice introductory chapter where she goes through many of the different uh, type of data sets which you can apply but it's a hybrid algorithm. And some people like to do that. It can be more time consuming. That's the only warning which we, which we would like to give. And unless you have studied machine learning, it can be a little bit more how to say, there may be a higher threshold in getting started properly. But we had last year people who actually worked on quantum Boltzmann machines and compare that because they had a code for classical Boltzmann machines and compare those results. So just give it a thought. And if you have some other ideas, please just shoot me a message and we will try to tailor the projects to the individual needs. But I would like to have, uh, even if we don't find a common denominator, probably the, I mean, for me, the easiest thing is actually to follow up on quantum Fourier transforms and look at specific algorithms for the rest of the semester. And I know that many of you are also interested in that topic. So even if you don't work on that in project two, you can uh, uh, still follow the lectures and uh, see what these algorithms stand for. Any questions to that? No, just give it a thought. And then I will try, based on your inputs, I will try to set up different variants, which will be available then the first week after the Easter break. Now, there's something which, uh, uh, I wanted to start with now, which is actually uh, what the topic called quantum Fourier transforms. So today we will go through the basic mathematics. And last year when I talked about quantum Fourier transforms, I actually assumed that people were pretty familiar with Fourier transforms. And it showed up that there was only 20% of the participants who had ever heard of Fourier transforms. So uh, I, so when I was presenting the mathematics, I had a lot of people with just which staring at me with, what does that mean? So do you mind if I remind you of some of the basics of Fourier transforms first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was thinking actually of starting with a standard, a standard continuous Fourier transform and just go through those details. And then we go over to a discrete Fourier transforms. And the discrete Fourier transform, the reason why I want to bring them up is that that links us with uh, this famous algorithm, which is called the fast Fourier transform, which is, it was actually in the last century, it was ranked as one of the top 10 algorithms in numerical mathematics. And uh, this is an algorithm which is always useful to have seen if you haven't heard of it. And then uh, when we then do the quantum Fourier transform, I will try to argue why that is even faster than the standard fast Fourier transform, which is really fast. So then you can, uh, hopefully then you can see, I mean, the kind of uh, the wood for the trees and the, the reason why a quantum Fourier transform is much more efficient. And then this enters uh, many of the other algorithms, which we may discuss after the break. So uh, it's always a little bit difficult to hit the right level, but I, I'm gonna start a little bit with some of the basic things 
and then see if I can reboot your memories because probably you've seen it scattered a little bit here and there. And uh, uh, let me also ask you, is, has, is there anyone here who's never seen a, a Fourier transform, standard Fourier transform? Okay, okay, so let's, uh, but let me try to be a little bit more, not exactly pedantic, but uh, give you the basic ideas. So I'm gonna switch to the, uh, to the whiteboard here. So the basic idea was proposed by Fourier, and that's why it's called a Fourier transform. And uh, this had to do with studies which Fourier made, and you know probably about Fourier's law, uh, where you actually look at the heat capacity and the way that relates over time and the way uh, the heat spreads in a material. So if you think of a rod uh, which you have uh, at a given time, T equals zero, that has an internal distribution of heat. And then when you put that into, let's say, a water basin, then after some time you reach an equilibrium and the uh, rod has the same temperature as the surrounding uh, environment. And if you were to plot it in the beginning, you could have a heat distribution, which looks like a sinus function. And then after some time, as time evolves, the temperature is getting closer and closer to the environment when the equilibrium has reached. And then if you were to plot it, it would just be a flat function. So that would be a typical example. And what Fourier proposed then is that if you have a periodic function, you can actually express that as a series in sines and cosines. Now, there is an important uh, restriction on the, the functions which you're looking at. So if you have a continuous function, So let's do that. Suppose this is a continuous function and T could stand for time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't, when I was watching my iPad, I didn't see that one, thanks. So let's assume that we have this continuous function and one of the main assumptions is that this function is bounded. So if I look at an interval between A and B where the function is defined, if I integrate up the absolute value squared of this function, this is less than or equal to the number M, which is smaller than infinity. So we would actually say that the function is bounded. Now, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, um, the function, this is one of the conditions which has to be fulfilled for the Fourier series to converge. So if you look, no, it's not the same as being bounded, but if the function fulfills that condition, then you can actually find a convergence criterion for the Fourier series. So that's the more correct way of saying it. Thanks. So the, um, uh, what, you, what Fourier then proposed is that this f of t would then be written out as a function where you sum from n equal one up to n, and then you have some coefficient a of n, and then you have a sine of two pi of n times t plus some phase phi of n, which can be a variable. Now this is normally rewritten in terms of the cosines and sines, so this is not the way, this was originally the way Fourier proposed it. But what you would often see is that this is written in terms of a constant, which is defined for n equals zero, and then a cosine and sine term. So normally what you would see is that this function is rewritten in terms of a constant, a2, a0 half, plus a sum over n equal one to n. And then we have an a, n, and this is a cosine of two pi of n times t, and then there's a new term. And these coefficients are unknown coefficients which need to be determined. Later, 
we will see an example of a specific function, which many of you have probably seen if you're taking a course in signaling, I mean, a square well function, uh, repeated ones. And this will be an example where actually this sum has to go to infinity. Uh, and then we are going to look at how well we can approximate such a function in terms of sines and cosines. But one of the important things is that these functions are periodic. So periodic means that this function repeats itself after a period t plus uppercase letter t, then this repeats itself here. So we say that they are periodic. Now it's pretty common. Uh, so I hope you don't find this too pedantic or too simple. It's uh, common to rewrite this in terms of exponentials. And then you would simply take the standard expressions for a cosine of t in terms of e of i t. I'm just reminding you of some equations which you most likely have seen many, many times, divided by two. And then we have a uh, sine of t, which is e of i t minus e of minus i t divided by two of i. And then we can rewrite the sum which you saw above in terms of uh, an exponential. So this f of t is then often rewritten in terms of n of minus n up to n here. And then we have a c of n of e to the two pi of i of n of t. And c zero is just equal to this constant a zero divided by two here. Now these coefficients are in general complex. So they are complex. And being complex means that uh, uh, they, due to the periodicity, and they normally satisfy that C of N is equal to C of minus N, complex conjugate is equal to C of minus N. So that's one of the conditions which we impose. And uh, when you now look at uh, uh, this function here, you can actually rewrite it. So I'm just doing that as a direct calculation. It's actually not that difficult to rewrite it like this. You can see that this can be rewritten as a real of n equals zero up to n of c of n of e of i of two pi of n times t. And this is actually easy if you see, if you do that, because if you rewrite, if you spell it out and then use that property, you can easily see that this has to be equal two times the real part of that function. So these are things which you probably have seen. Uh, some of these things are things which I will just uh, uh, state. Uh, and then other things are things which I will actually show. So the question then is, the important question is actually, how do we find these coefficients C of N? So if you look at these coefficients C of N, uh, how do we find C of N? So let's just pick out one of them, and then we are going to multiply uh, the uh, equation with the uh, inverse of e to the i2 pi nt. So let's just pick out one of these. So we isolate that one on the right-hand side and we multiply both sides. Sides, let me just correct this one. by e of minus two pi i of k of t. So that means that what I'm gonna get then is e to the minus two pi i of k of t multiply with f of t. And that is equal to uh, this sum here, which I'm just gonna write this like this. So these are all the terms of e to the minus two pi i of k of t multiplied with c of k of e of two pi of i of k of t. And then I have the remaining terms. So what I would do then is then to shift over to the other side. 
uh, the C of K. And what I would get then is that C of K is equal. And this actually doesn't solve anything, what I'm doing here now. But I'm just using this as an intermediate step to show you the final expression. So the uh, what you get then is an e to the minus two pi e i of k of t times f of t. And then I have the remaining terms, which are minus, and then I have a sum from n equal minus n. And then I have a condition that n is different from k. And then I have up to n here, and then I have c n of e of two pi of i, and then n minus k multiplied. This is a multiply with a t here. And then what I do now, I'm assuming a period of uh, one, assuming period one. And then afterwards, I'm gonna show you that the period can be made arbitrary. That just introduces a normalization constant. So what I'm gonna do now is to integrate from zero to one because my period is defined to one. So I integrate both sides from zero to one. Uh, and then what I do now uh, is to get the following expression. So I'm going to get an expression if I now use as an intermediate step. So let me just do that intermediate step here of two pi of i of n minus k of t of dt. So that the integral is pretty easy to solve. So this is in the case if n is different from k, only that case, because that's the term uh, which I'm going to be interested in here. I mean, this term here. So let me just bring that up. And so that one gives me one over two pi of i of n minus k. And when I do the integration, I get one minus one, which is just equal to zero. Then uh, what I get then when I do perform this integration is that I have C of K, which then is equal to zero to one, and then E to the minus two pi I of K of T times this function F of T, D of T. And then we have to plug in the function and then we can find the values for C of K. Uh, just in some few moments, I will show you how this looks like for the square well. And then we are going to look at a numerical demonstration on how the square well behaves in terms of a Fourier approximation or Fourier uh, transform. So one of the things which is uh, uh, interesting for us then is that these terms here, so we can just generalize this to the general function. Uh, if we did not assume that, uh, uh, so we did not assume here that f of t is a real signal. If it is real, then, so if f of t is a real function, then there are some simplifications here then what you will have is that the C of N complex conjugate is actually equal to C of N. And uh, what we assume obviously is that T, DT and F of T are real. Then you can actually show that. So that means that uh, when I then co compute the complex conjugate, uh, this quantity is actually the C of N complex conjugate here I'm sorry, this should be C of N minus here. Let me just correct that one. C of minus N. So that means that uh, the C of N is actually then equal to the integral from zero to one of E to the two pi I N of T. And then I have F of T, D of T. Because T and F of T and DT are real, so just taking the complex conjugate uh, affects only this term here. And I had e to the minus two pi i. So just change, it just changes the i here, right? Okay. So some more mathematics here. So if, uh, uh, let me, 
Let me just remind myself of what I wanted to say here. Yeah, it's actually in the literature, what you will often see is that this C of N is often rewritten in terms of a function F of N. And this is given in terms of zero to one of E to the minus two pi of I N of T, F of T dt. And probably if you have taken a course in mathematical methods in physics or mathematical methods in general, you have probably encountered the Fourier transforms and Fourier series in solving differential equations. So a typical term like the kinetic energy or second derivative can be Fourier transformed to momentum space. And then it just like momentum squared times the unknown function which you're searching the solution for. This is, I don't know if you're taking a course in mathematical methods, but this is a typical a thing which you would, a typical element which you would encounter. Uh, one thing which is very useful is also that this f of zero is actually given by zero to one. And then we have f of t of dt. And this is, if you take a uniform distribution, which is just one here and divide by the number of the, uh, samples you do, this is just the average value of the integral. So you can find that coefficient immediately by just performing that integral, yeah? So I just said that, yeah, I said, I said that the period was one. Now I'm going to make a, a different period, but I'm going to show that that integral is, is independent of the uh, interval which you set up, as long as you assume the periodicity. The only thing which you will get in addition is a normal, normalizing constant. So let me show you that now, because that's the next step. So one thing which is important is that this integral had an, an interval of length one. And uh, 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 what I will do now is actually to calculate this one uh, for an arbitrary interval. So we want to integrate, suppose we now want to integrate from a to a plus one. So these are just scaled quantities. I assume that the length of the period is one now, but you obviously, you know that the periods do not need to be one. So that will just introduce a new constant. So let's see that uh, this interval is actually, or this integral is actually independent of that. So one of the things we need to show then is that if I take the derivative here of this quantity, so suppose now I integrate from a to a plus one, and then I take this interval, this inter integrant to pi i n of t, and then I have f of t of dt. And then I want to see how it varies as a function of a. So see how it varies. as function of A. So if I now uh, perform this integral, I mean, since I have a derivative here, that means that what I get is just a e to the minus two pi of i, and then I have to of times n of a plus one, and then I have my f of a plus one, and this is minus e to the minus two pi of i of n times a of f of a. Now, what I'm going to have now is the following. I have that this function is periodic and I have scaled the period to be equal to one. Later, I'm just gonna put in a general period. So this is equal to f of a. If I do that, I can replace uh, these two quantities here, in here, and obviously in here. And the only thing which I'm left with then is a constant here, where I have this term here. So let me just take this term, and then I have uh, multiplied with one. And what I get then is actually the following. 
So this is going to be equal to e of minus two pi of i of n times a of e of minus two pi of i of n. And then I have f, sorry, f of a minus e of minus two pi i of n of a with f of a. And since I know that e of two pi of i and n, and n is an integer, this is always equal to one because I have two pi, n is an integer. Then what we see then, if I use that one, then this quantity is just equal to zero. So that means if I take the derivative respect to a, it shows that it does not vary as a function of a, so it's independent of a. So I fixed the period to, to one actually. Now, so what we typically would do next is to uh, uh, plug in a uh, given period. And let me just see here because there was something else I wanted to say. Mm. Yeah, there are some, some other relations which uh, can be useful uh, and which transfer to discrete Fourier transform, but also to quantum Fourier transform. So uh, let me just mention that bypassing. If f is an even function, that means that so is also, so is this f hat, where you remember now that f hat of n was simply given by an interval from zero to one here, but now we're gonna make this more general. And this was given by e to the minus two pi i of n of t multiply with f of t of d of t. So if we are working with functions which uh, have a period t, so let's now assume now we have a period of length t. What that means is that I would have a function g of t of the given time, which then repeats itself. And then I would have t times t. So uh, what I would do then when I'm now setting in uh, this uh, period, so you could have something like uh, two pi times t, just to give you an example of a typical period you could think of. It's pretty common. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to write uh, a new variable, introduce that one as s of t times t, uppercase t. So that means that I'm going to have this g of t, which is just now a function of f of s. And uh, this f of s, when I'm now plugging in uh, into my equations, I'm going to have f of s, which is given by this g of t. And that is going to be given by these coefficients. So I'm gonna have a sum and I'm gonna let this go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And I have a c of n of e of two pi of i of n times s, but now I'm gonna divide by t. I'm just changing these variables. So that means that what are normally called the harmonics. So these uh, functions which you see here, these are normally called the harmonics. The only thing which changes now is that you have a new variable, s divided by t here. So if you then uh, calculate these uh, coefficients now, if you now calculate this g transformed as a function of this variable n, then this is just gonna be one over t. And then I have an integral from zero to t. And then I will have an e minus two pi of i of n of s divided by t. And then I'm gonna have my g of s and d of s. So the, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, 
problems which we are going to look at now is a simple example. So we are now going to look at the square well pulse. So let me just put that up as an example. So I have a square well pulse. And in my case, now I'm going to have f of t. And I'm going to look at a period of one just to make life simple. This is going to be given by plus one when I have zero less than t less than a half. And then minus one when it's when it has these conditions here. And we are looking at a period of one. So this is just going to be a square well, which propagates. Uh, now I can calculate these coefficients. So these coefficients f of n is going to be given by zero to one. And then I have e of minus two pi of i of n of t of f of t of dt. And if I plug in a function, so I hope you don't get offended if I skip the in calculation of integrals, because this is pretty trivial because you're just going into integrate e of the mind, e to the minus two pi i and t multiplied with one or minus one. So it's not the most exciting exercise. So I'm just gonna write down the answer here. So you're gonna get one divided by pi of i of n. And then we have one minus e of minus pi i of n. So that means that the, the kind of Fourier series which we get when we plug this in to the expression, what we get then is the following final answer for the uh, uh, for, uh, for these coefficients. So what I will have when I plug this in is that my uh, function is going to be represented by an infinite series where I now take away n different from zero of one divided by pi of i of n. And then I have one minus e of minus pi i of n. And this is multiplied by these so-called harmonics, which is now given by two pi i n of t. And that's where I had the time dependence. So one thing to note now is that one minus e to pi of i n is actually equal to zero if n is even, and two if n is odd. So this is a joke, uh, it's actually a kind of legend. There was supposedly a professor in mathematics who got twins, and uh, in Norwegian, odd and even are names for boys, and he just called his sons odd and even. Right. So in Norwegian, that makes perfect sense. But that just, it's supposedly a legend. That's fun. Okay, so that means that since these are uh, zero when n is even, uh, what we get then is that our function f of t can be written out as just as a sum where n is odd. I'm just writing it like this. And then I have a two over pi of i n. And then I have e to the two pi of i n of t. So after the break, uh, we are actually going to uh, look at the simulation of this function. We can actually do it now. So let's just do that before the break and switch back to the uh, Jupyter notebook. And then you will see that uh, there are some small problems with uh, this transformation, which you see here. So if we now uh, look at the typical function, uh, this is the way the function is gonna look like. I, it just scaled a little bit differently from what I did in the notes. So this is the function we want to approximate with a uh, Fourier series. And you have the analytical expression here. Now, if you then uh, just scroll down here, so this is the way we are going to approximate it. And the uh, scientific Python has actually a, a, a set of codes, which are called signal as a class, where you can actually modulate this type of signal. And then we are simply going to implement the formula you have. 
uh, which you saw now, and I'm going to use, uh, I can use 400 uh, elements in that sum, or you can reduce it. So if you now look at it, it looks seemingly well. So the blue one is actually my square well, and the orange one is my approximation. If I now reduce this uh, down to, let's say, 40, so let's just repeat that. And you see now I have a period of, I actually switched the period of 0.2 just to fit into the graphs. Now you see that it's not that good. So it just gets worse and worse. So if you amplify uh, the graph here, you will see that it has a wiggling behavior around the corners here. Why should we have that? Any good ideas? Yeah. Yeah. So here, if you go back to the analytical expression, we would have to sum to infinity to get the right behavior at these discontinuities. So we are, as, as was said now, we are approximating a discontinuous function at certain steps with continuous functions. So the sines and cosines are continuous functions. So with a finite number of terms, what you will see if you blow up here, even if you now put this to uh, 500, so what you will see in the corners here, there will be some wiggling around, and that's simply because you're not able to catch the discontinuity, because you're fitting a discontinuity with a finite set of continuous functions. So this is just to mention some of the problems. Often, in many cases, these series terminate because some of the coefficients are just zero. But you can have cases where you need an infinity of terms. So what typically what people would do in this type of calculations is actually to truncate the Fourier series at a given value of n and say that this is my error and I can live happily with that error. So this is just a just a small a small observation in case you have a discont a function with a discontinuity. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so so why do we want to do that? that that's a very good point. So uh, that's a very, why do we want to fit a function like this? So if you have a periodic function, this is a very handy way to fit a function. Yes, yes, exactly. And there is another thing which is very important now is that what you have is a series of orthogonal functions. So your basis is orthogonal. And that is going to be very handy when we are going to make transformations. So the, uh, the Fourier basis is a very handy uh, expansion. When you have something which is periodic, that lends itself to a Fourier expansion. And it's also a technique. I, I would say this is one of the most useful techniques, one of the most useful ones which we have in uh, applied mathematics. And if you are solving differential equations, you can often find the solution in terms of these type of uh, Fourier expansions. So it's an extremely powerful uh, tool for solving differential equations or even approximating a function, which you know is periodic. Yeah? Yeah, I, I hear some, sometimes also you, have, you can, when you have a Fourier term for yeah. something like so-called you will see the real something yes. like that. Uh, you know, use all points. You can yeah. use only, for example, in this case, in three points, something yeah. like that. You can model all. That's that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, very important. And also, there's a, there's another important topic, which I will mention after the break, and which deals with uh, uh, the convolution as a mathematical operation, because that is an important aspect when we are going to look at the fast Fourier transform. So this is a kind of long story, 
in the sense that we want to show that the quantum Fourier transform is faster than the best Fourier transform algorithm, which is a fast Fourier transform. I went a little bit over time. Should we take a small break? Is that okay with everybody? So we just do, yeah. So after the break, I was planning to say something about Fourier transforms a little bit more with the discrete ones. And then uh, we will uh, spend the, let's say the last 25, 30 minutes on discussing the project, if that is okay with everybody. Yeah, project one, yeah. yes, project one. Yes, yes. So I, want, I wanted to add some more details and this one of the details is about discrete Fourier transform, which is the one which links immediately with quantum Fourier transforms. Again. Now, there is an important technicality which uh, uh, is useful when we are going to look at the, the fast Fourier transform. And this technicality deals with the uh, process of convolution, which probably many of you have seen. So before the break, we went through some of the basics of Fourier transforms and why these are interesting. And uh, the uh, Fourier transform, the way we have written it, uh, and this is pretty common to have this kind of integration factor one over two pi. And uh, we uh, have the definition of the Fourier transform like this. And then similarly, we would have a, another function G, uh, which Fourier transform is given by this transformation, which you see here through this integral. And then we have the inverse Fourier transform, which is the normally written like this, F uppercase letter F minus one. And that is obviously given by e to the plus i omega, which we have here. And then you can do uh, the inverse of the two functions, f and g. And this is often rewritten like this. And you can write this function in terms of this product here plus the integral. And then uh, you can rewrite this function, which you see in here, in terms of these integrals. So you have an integral of y, an integral of w. And what you see here now is that this just ends simply into this integral here. And this is uh, typically the mathematical definition of a convolution. And the way this is often used in, let's say, signal processing is that you are looking at a function here where you have, uh, suppose this F represents some kind of noise or some filter, F for filter. And then you're making measurements of uh, how your car moves on a bumpy road. And your measurements are pretty, I would say, noisy to a certain point. And what you're trying to do then with this function here is to try to filter away the noise. So that is one typical interpretation. It's used in signal uh, theory. It's used in, uh, the, uh, in machine learning when you think of convolutional neural networks because then uh, you're trying to filter away or to reduce the dimensionality of the problem by applying a function f, which then can be interpreted as a weight function or a filter or whatever you might like to call it. And this is a common trick which is used in signal processing. So that's the mathematical process of convolution. Now, this is uh, just an, a small aside. Uh, what I wanted to uh, jump into now is just to set up the basis for a discrete Fourier transformation. And we will need that one when we move in to quantum Fourier transforms after the Easter break. So uh, the kind of discrete Fourier transform which we are interested in, so let's just change page here. So suppose I have a, a vector x, which we have labeled like this, but let's just keep it as a vector here, just to simplify a little bit the notation. So this uh, vector has these elements up to some xn minus one. And this vector is a, in general, a complex quantities. So these xj's are complex numbers. In general, the 
Then I can define a Fourier transform, a discrete one, where I have now a component y of k. So I'm going to define a new vector. And this is going to be given by, and you will see later, these are either orthogonal or unitary transformations. So we have a one over square root of n. So this is just a kind of notation which is being used. So the so-called harmonics, which we defined before the break, have then the sum from j up to n minus one. And then I have xj and e to the pi, two pi of i. So this is the mathematical i. And then this is multiply with j and k divided by n. So the output is also a complex vector with complex entries. So it means that uh, this uh, vector which I'm producing, this y's, so let me just write it down. So the y vector, I'm making this bold face to indicate that this is a vector would then be given by one over square root of n. And then I have the different components, which now are given by series. So I would have a j equals zero up to n minus one. I have an x of j of e of two pi of i of j. So this is the variable j. And this is the first component. So I have the zero. So that is actually k equal to zero. That's the first component I have there. So this is y zero, and then multi divided by n. Then the next term. So what the term what you see here, this term here, is just y zero. And then the second term, which is y one, has a similar sum j equals zero up to n minus one, and then I have an x j of e of two pi, of i and then times j, and then it's multiplied with one divided by n. And this goes all the way down here to j equals zero to n minus one. And then I have xj e of two pi i times j. And then I have n minus one divided by n. And that's the last term. So these are also complex number. And th this is something which we could rewrite in a more compact form, as you will see a little bit later. But let's just take a simple example so that we gain some kind of intuition about what is going on. And the form which you see here is going to be something similar to the way we will encode the quantum Fourier transform. Now, this uh, type of discrete transformations are also the basis of the famous algorithm of fast Fourier transforms, which we will discuss a little bit later after the Easter break. So if you now take as a simple example, so we could now assume that we have X is given by these two components, one and two, and then we have an X zero, which is this one, and then we have X one, which is this one. So uh, after this example, we will stop there and then uh, bring this up again after the break. So I would suggest that we keep working on the project and discuss the project afterwards. So if I now look at the term with k equal to zero, that gives us now a y zero, that specific component. And if I plug in the results, I have one over square root of two. And then since I have j no, as k equal to zero, that means that in here, I have zeros. So that simply gives me plus two divided by square root of two. So if you go back to the formula, so you see x one is equal to x zero is equal to one. So for the second term, I have two here, and that's the one which gives me the two here. And then I take the next term. If I take k equal to one, then I have y one is equal to one over square root of two. And then I have plus two square root of two, but then it's multiplied by i times pi. And I know that i, e to the i of pi is minus one. So this is simply one over square root of two 
minus two divided over square root of two. And that is the same as minus one over square root of two. And I forgot actually to put the final answer here. So this is three divided by square root of two. Now, if you look closer at what we did, what we have is a vector y with two components, which is given by y0 and y1. And that is given by a matrix U multiplied with x0 and x1. That is just another way of writing down what we did. So if you do that, uh, you will see then that this matrix U in this particular case is actually given by one over square root of two. And then I have one, 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 and minus one. But later, we're gonna recognize this as a Hadamard matrix when we do quantum uh, Fourier transforms. But this is just a, a case which by, by accident, I just put in these numbers and it just looks like this. So the, the thing which is interesting here is also that if I take U of T of U, this just becomes equal to the identity matrix. So after the break, we are going to look at uh, the unitarities of these transformations and the fact that uh, if the, we start with an orthogonal basis, we end up with a new orthogonal basis. So the elements which you see here, these basic elements, these transformations which you see, these are what defines a discrete Fourier transforms. And these tools are used then to define the fast Fourier transform algorithm. And we are going to use this uh, in a quantum uh, context and we are going to rewrite that in a slightly different form. And we will rephrase that in terms of circuits and gates, which then can allow us to implement the quantum Fourier transform. And we will try to argue after the break why this is faster than the standard fast Fourier transform, if you can operate on a quantum computer. And uh, just to keep this kind of overarching view on it, uh, this algorithm enters uh, things like algorithms like the quantum phase estimation algorithm, but also the uh, uh, algorithm of Shaw for factorization. But now I suggest that we uh, spend the rest of the time uh, discussing the finalization of the project and questions you have. And Karen is also here now, so we have more people we can you can discuss with. So uh, if that is okay with everybody, I'm going to stop the recording here. And then we spend the rest of the time discussing the, uh, the project.